All right, this is chapter two, Origins of American Government. In this chapter, um, the five essential questions are, how did the English political heritage affect the development of democracy in America? What events led to declaring our independence? Why did American leaders conclude that the Articles of Confederation needed to be modified? What challenges did the framers have to overcome as they wrote the Constitution? And lastly, how did the Bill of Rights come about and what is its significance? All right, so to start off this first objective, um, section one here, explain why the colonists expected a limited and representative form of government even before they even came over to the United States or the new land. Um, well, the reason they expected to have a limited representative government, it was part of their heritage. It's something they grew up with and seen while they're in England. Um, an example of why they had this heritage of a limited government was um, the Magna Carta, which was uh, first passed or was passed in 1215 by King John, who um, unwillingly was forced to pass the Magna Carta, which basically said that he was just like everyone else. He's not above the law, but he is subject to the law just like everyone else. Um, he was trying to well, he wanted to raise taxes on the nobles in England to help pay for a war um, that the nobles didn't really want to pay for. And um, basically, uh, this was the significance because it, it made this move from the rule of man to the rule of law, meaning that there was no man above the law. Um, meaning that every king and queen had to obey English laws that were passed. So this is, this is very significant, just the fact that it is one of the first um, times that in England the government was was limited in what the king and king, queen can and cannot do. Um, another example of this heritage back in England is the Petition of Rights. Um, this was a document that required monarchs to, to obtain Parliament's approval before they um, raised or lowered uh, new taxes. So they needed to get consent from Parliament before they were going to do that. Um, also, they cannot imprison people without any cause. Um, they couldn't lodge, have soldiers held up in people's house, houses without against their will, and establish military rule during peacetime. And these are, again, more limits um, being imposed upon the government itself. Um, and also is kind of the beginning of individual rights being developed in England as well. So this is, this is taking place in the 1600s. Um, this was signed by Charles I in 1628, the Petition of Rights. And the third example of a limited form of government back in England was the English Bill of Rights itself. Um, now, the English Bill of Rights, one provision is that it basically says no monarch is a, the monarchs aren't above absolute authority. They um, rule with the people and the representatives that are in back in Parliament. Monarch must have, again, consent from the parliament to either raise laws, suspend, suspend laws, raise taxes, or even have an army um, in another country, let's say. They cannot interfere with parliamentary elections and debates. That's one of the key characteristics of a democracy is having free elections. So having kings and queens and um, people of the monarch interfering with that would, would totally go against the, the ideas of a democracy. And uh, number four here, People have the right to petition the government and have fair and speedy trials. Again, these are just more rights given to the people. If you do, if you're against the government, you have a right to protest and not fear for your uh, lives or being put in jail for some for no reason other than just not agreeing with them. And if you are um, charged with crime, it should be fair and, and fast. You don't have to rot in jail forever. So I think there's one more maybe here. Yeah, um, people should not be subject to cruel and unusual punishments or excessive fines and bills. Something you should be familiar with. You've heard this is something we have here in America. Um, you know, we have, we've determined what, what is cruel, the courts have determined what is cruel and unusual punishment here in, in the United States today. So again, more, more limits being put on the government on what they can and cannot do to the people and they're also giving rights to people as well. So again, this is a heritage that was brought over to, to America. Um, Back when they were English, back in England, they um, had this idea of a limited form of government. Now, the idea of a representative government came from England, England's uh, parliament itself. Um, they had a two-chamber system, a bicameral, 
that had an upper house or upper chamber that represented the house of lords. These are the the so the aristocrat or the the more the nobles. They were the ones that represented or made up were part of the makeup of the upper chamber of the parliament, and then the lower chamber, the House of Commons, was elected by property owners. So if you're a property owner, then you could elect these people into um, into power, into government. So this idea of having people represent you in the government was um, established back in back in the the parliament in England, and these ideas is what was part of their heritage when they came over to America to lead them to have these same type of government here in America as well, like we do today. Okay, so they had this heritage. It was brought over when they came, when the pilgrims came over here. Um, and they established these types of governments as soon as they got here. Um, each colony had its own government. Um, some examples of written constitutions. The pilgrims, when they first came over, they wrote the Mayflower Compact, which um, was just you know another just an example. Of they brought this heritage over to um, the colonies from from England. Mm -hmm. um, writing the Mayflower Compact is the first example of having a self self government, meaning they govern themselves, not by not by England, but by themselves. Um, another example of a written constitution is the Great Fundamentals. Um, set up the first system of laws here in the colonies and the last one which is also the first formal constitution is the fundamental orders of Connecticut um, this gave people the right to elect governors, judges, and representatives to make laws so there was a heritage they had back in England as soon as the first people came over to the new land, the new world they started establishing um, these principles that they inherited back in England by passing these written constitutions like the Mayflower Compact, Fundamentals, and the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. And the idea of separation of powers as well was um, was already in place early on in the colonial life. Um, many of the colonies had these had divided powers of governments within their colonies. So they had written constitutions and they had this principle of separation of powers established early on in the colonial life um, here in America. Alright, so second objective here, what events led to the colonists to unite against British law, which led to the Declaration of Independence itself? Well, the, the, um, the colonists had problems with the French, and the French were trying to take over the colonies, colonies' land as their own, um, because there's many resources there on the new land and England knew, recognized this and they wanted to keep protect their investments that they had in the colonies over in the new world and they didn't want French to take it over and um, have that economic benefit from taken away from them so they fought the war, the French and Indian War they sent troops over to um, help fight with the colonists against the French and Indian, the Indians teamed up with the French Native Americans, they teamed up with the French and um, they eventually defeated them, and because of this, um, Britain, Britain begins to tighten their control over the colonies, and the reason why is they have this large debt from the war, the French and Indian War itself, and this debt they need to pay off. They don't want to be stuck with having debt. Debt's not good. You don't want to have, you don't want to have, a, large, have a large debt. So what they did, what they came up with was, let's tax the colonists, and the problem with taxing colonists leads to the colonists point of view of the colonists was that it's not fair representation. There's no one in Parliament from the colonies over there in England representing them to allow this to take place. And so this is where you get the whole no taxation without representation. Um, protests are taking place. And um, the way they, I'm sorry, this so kind of backtracks, the way they tax the colonists is the Stamp Act. Um, the Stamp Act was one that's is the first attempt to tax the colonists directly. Um, it required tax stamps on paper, goods, legal documents, contracts, licenses, newspapers, almanacs, printed sermons, playing cards. Um, and a lot of these uh, tax collectors had a fear for their lives after the, um, the colonists became enraged over this. So Stamp Act was just the, the beginning of the taxation without representation that starts this whole um, brewing. Well, yeah, starts this whole... Um, 
brewing of uh, declaring for independence. Um, so because of this, they wanted to unite. The colonists unite. And one of the ways they took action was creating the Stamp Act Congress. Um, this Congress was, they had representatives from all the different, all the 13 colonies come together and they sent a petition to the king to declare that their loyalty, that their loyalty be voiced in strong protest and that the power to tax colonies should belong only to the colonial assemblies, only to the colonies themselves, not parliament. So basically they, they got together, band together, and they wrote a letter to the king saying please, or not please, but basically saying this is not fair, only the colonies can raise taxes, not the parliament. Um, another organization that came about was the Committees of Correspondence, and they, they were more, more of a, kind of a more of a violent organization. They wanted, they really wanted to resist. It wasn't peaceful, like, hey, let's, can you please not do this? They were, they really wanted to uh, um, kick the British out of the colonists, and um, they wrote letters as well. Um, and uh, one of the all, one of the activists for the Committee of Correspondence was Sam Adams, which you may have heard of before. Um, in the last, oh, and so because of these protests, oh, actually, so what happened was you have the um, the Boston Tea Party takes place, and because of that, the King of England, King George the Third, he passes harsher laws that were in response to the Boston Tea Party and basically this law closed Boston Harbor they ended all their all their rule over Massachusetts um, they allowed quartering of the British troops um, and basically they shut down Britain I'm sorry Britain and Tarwax shut down Boston Boston the city of Boston and got rid of all their government any type of government institution um, in response to the Stamp Act Congress and Committee of Correspondence in the Boston Tea Party, really. So, the colonists, they react back. Um, they, again, get together, called the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia, and, again, they send another petition to King George III um, demanding that they repeal the Intolerable Acts placed on Massachusetts and to end British military occup occupation and restore the power of the colonies to impose their own taxes. Um, they also wanted to boycott, let's see if I have on here, yeah, boycott or embargo, have an embargo on Britain so basically not allowing any British goods to come to the colonies. Again, the colonies are there as an economic benefit to Britain so they wouldn't, you know, that's, that's not good for Britain if the that they can no longer trade with the colonies. So they impose an embargo, no longer trading with them until their demands are met. Um, the British rejected this demand, and um, because of this, soon after you had the Lexington Concord clash, where um, British troops and, and colonial militia start firing at each other. No one really knows who f fired first, but... Um, Shots are fired, and you have your kind of the beginning of the Revolutionary War right there. And the second time they meet again, so the the first Continental Congress took place. They sent a they sent a letter and posed an embargo. And after that, you have the Lexington Concord takes place. So they meet again in the second Continental Congress. And um, one of the first actions they want to do was to organize a militia. Um, under called officially called the Continental Army, under led by George Washington as his commander, and this is just kind of to try to force the British out of the colonies. But some delegates that were at this Congress, Second Continental Congress, still thought that they could reconcile the relation with Great Britain and not have to go to war or not have to break away like we eventually do. Um, so. Basically, after three weeks, or they said so they meet three weeks later, they assume powers of central government um, because King George III basically says uh, if, that they're rebellion and that they're going to bring he's going to bring these traitors to justice. Basically, he's going to kill them because he feels like they're all rebellion just by meeting and having these these talks and building up an army. So 
three weeks later, they take over power of the central government, and you basically have the beginning of the well, beginnings of our declaring our independence, and the Revolution War is also taking place as well. Um, so July second, they passed the resolution to declare their independence, which was the resolution was introduced by Henry Lee from Virginia. Um, Thomas Jefferson is the one who wrote the Declaration of Independence, and on July 4th, they actually adopted the Declaration of Independence, which is why we celebrated on the 4th. Um, parts of the Declaration. Well, the first part of it is, this, is a statement saying that every human has basic rights, and they we feel like they've been broken. Um, just the first paragraph here uh, says, in the course of human events, and this is the Declaration of Independence, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which they have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and the natures of God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel or force them to be to the separation. So, the verse statement is just basically say we have we have laws, natural laws given to us by God, and we feel like we need to, um, we are forced now to break away and separate from from um, England. And then it goes on and just lists um, a bunch of complaints against George III, all the different things that he has done to the colonists, like quartering a large army of troops, um, cutting off their trade with other parts of the world, imposing taxes without consent, um, Let's see what else they have him for suspending their own legislators, declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all case whatsoever. And it goes on and on with a list of different complaints against King George III, why they feel like they have to break away. And the last the last portion portion of the declaration is the um, they see no peaceful solution. Basically, there is nothing else they can do but declare their independence. And there you go. We have we have declared our independence, and you know we win. Um, we eventually def defeat or defeat the British, and um, when that takes place, we have to come up with our own government now and this new system of government. And we talked earlier in chapter one about different systems of government. You have unitary, federal, and confederate or confederal system of government, and the United States first set up a confederal form of government, and it's called the Articles of Confederation. So this objective here, explain the powers, weaknesses, and achievements of the Articles of Confederation. Um, under the Articles of Confederation, we had a single chamber Congress, meaning there was not, there's not like, like today we have a two-chamber bicameral Congress. There's a Senate and a House of Representatives. Um, under the Articles of Confederation, we just had one chamber, one chamber of Congress, that's it. There wasn't a separation of power, there was no president, there was no executive branch, there was no judicial branch, um, just the Congress. That was the only national um, government institution established under the Articles of Confederation. Um, it was very limited um, by what they can and cannot do. Again, the confederal system of government is the states band together and they limit the national government. And this is what the Articles of Confederation did. It, it limited a lot, so much so that it didn't really work out. But um, some of the limits here is they only got, every state got one vote each, no matter how popular, not popular, but how um, populated your state was, you got one vote. Um, all right, the powers. So powers under the Articles of Confederation, the Congress's powers under the Articles of Confederation was they make war and peace, Send and receive ambassadors to other nations, make treaties, they can raise a navy, uh, request army from states, basically saying they can say, Massachusetts, could you please send us some military? And they can say yes or no. Um, approval of senior officers. They determine what weights and measures were. Handle all Native American affairs. Um, handle the post office. And decide certain disputes among states. Now, so those are the powers that they have, but the weaknesses um, are they couldn't tax. So they had the power 
to, um, they didn't really have the power to raise, they could raise a navy or, or an army, but they couldn't pay for it unless the states would give them money. Um, so they couldn't tax the states if they wanted to. They can ask the states for money, but they couldn't actually tax them. Um, they couldn't regulate the trade between states. Uh, they couldn't even, no power to enforce the laws. Again, there's only Congress. There's no, they have no national army to enforce the laws that they even actually pass. Um, they need nine out of the 13 states or colonies to agree on any law to be voted on. Um, just to agree before they can vote. And then, so nine of them had to agree to vote, and then they need all 13 to even pass something. Um, so that makes it very difficult to get all 13 people to agree on one thing, or any th in 13 states on anything to agree. Just imagine going to a movie with 13 people and trying to agree on one movie. That would be kind of hard to do. Um, again, there's only one government institution. It's Congress, no president, no executive branch, which, which is a weakness because they're the ones that enforce the laws that are passed. Um, they had to do much, most of the work themselves in committees and they get no national courts. And uh, so the states, the states determined what the national laws meant, not the Supreme Court. There was no Supreme Court. So these weaknesses really outweighed the powers that they had, which again, that's what a confederate form of system of government is, is you limit the national or central government itself. And the Articles of Confederation did exactly that. However, there were um, a very minimum achievements under the Articles of Confederation. Um, and what that was is how they were going to develop the western lands. So all the lands west of the colonies, um, they came up with a system on how to develop that. There were already states that ceded, that had made claims to those land, and they, they were able to get the states to cede or um, not claim those lands and give it up to the national government itself. And they passed two ordinances to help develop these lands. One of the ordinance of 75, which came up with a way to survey and divide the land up. And the Northwest Ordinance, um, which probably the greatest success, um, is settling a plan to um, develop this territory for new states. And um, some of these states include Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, so they basically, the, the one at Chima was, how do we develop the western lands um, west of the colonies? And that was the one achievement they did have. Um, oh, the other thing was treaties. They did sign a treaty with England, a peace treaty, so we weren't at war with them anymore. And they developed cabinet departments. Um, within the, the Congress. Um, fourthly, state cooperation, encourage states to recognize state legal acts. Um, oh, so, you know, basically, if, what if a state passed a law, other states recognize those state laws. So they were to get the states to cooperate that way. So those are four achievements under the Articles of Confederation. The big one is the Northwest Ordinances. The way that the way they developed lands, that's the biggest one there. Um, however, they still they needed a stronger government, and this is um, this is basically what broke the camel's back was Shays' Rebellion. But there was other challenges that the Congress faced under the Argos Federation that led them to um, get rid of it and start again. Um, war debts, um, sluggish economy, um, civil unrest. Um, but basically, the biggest problem was the war debts. They couldn't. They had. A, they borrowed lots of money from foreign countries and wealthy Americans to pay for the war, the Revolutionary War, and they owed a lot of money back to those people. Even the soldiers themselves that fought in it, they couldn't pay them back, and um, they called upon the states to approve tax on imports. And you need an unanimous consent, which they none of them want to do. So the states never um, unanimously consented to tax imports because they didn't want to have to pay that. Um, the economy was slowing down, and many far I mean, it really hurt the farmers particularly. And because of that, you have um, Shays Rebellion. All right, so um, yeah, Massachusetts legislature asked Congress for help, um, but Congress had no money to to put down Shays Rebellion. So 
uh, they, stay, they, uh, they established a state militia to scatter Shays and his angry mob. Um, this just showed how the people, the, how um, poor the Confederation Congress was, and when it comes to getting rid of a um, conflict. And uh, this made the move to revise the Articles of Confederation that much more important. But if you think about it, Shea, Shea was just doing exactly what the colonists did prior to the American Revolution was he felt like he was being taxed unfairly and um, staged his, wanted to stage his own revolution. However, he was um, stopped compared to the American colonies. colonists. They were not stopped by the British. They were able to uh, defeat the British. So... Um, just a minor, a mini, mini example of a uh, of revolt or, or being having the power to resist your government and um, try to change things. But he did change. He helped. He helped change the Articles of Confederation, and what we have is the Constitution today. So let's break down the making of the Constitution. All right, the way it was organized was President or Washington. I'm sorry, it wasn't um, Washington wasn't president yet, but he was to preside over the meeting. Of the Constitutional Convention, um, every state got one vote, and majority wins. Um, and seven of those delegates from the thirteen colonies had to be present for even any business to take place. And it was also kept a secret; um, no one knew what was going on, um, other than the delegates inside the meeting itself. Um, so one of the things they agreed upon, the delegates, was that we needed to, they needed to abandon the articles and start again, form a limited representative form of government like they've, they inherited back in England that they brought over here, um, have a national government that's divided, so instead of a confederate system of government, but a federal system of government, and limit states to uh, coin money and strengthen the national government itself. So instead of a weak national government, they're going to divide the powers to make it more stronger, the national government itself. All right, so to do this, there was a lot of um, controversy controversy that they had to resolve and conflict took place. Um, one of these conflicts was this, this, the way um, Congress was going to be set up. And the compromise is called the Great Compromise. Um, there were two ideas of how to set up the government. One was called the Virginia Plan by the state of the, the state of Virginia. They wanted a strong uh, national legislator, um, lower chosen by the people, kind of set up like um, the um, British Parliament with the upper chosen by the lower and lower chosen by the by the people, and a strong national executive chosen by the national legislator. So basically, Congress would choose who the president was. And having a national judiciary or supreme court that's appointed by the legislator today, the president appoints those people, and the Senate confirms them. So that's Virginia's plan. New Jersey, they wanted a weaker national legislator, not as strong as Virginia's, um, a unicameral, meaning one one chamber, like it was under the Articles of Confederation. Virginia's plan was was a bicameral, two chambers, a lower and upper chamber. So they wanted a unicameral, where one state um, got one vote. And this this legislator or Congress had the power to tax and regulate trade. Having a national executive, uh, more than one person. So instead of having one president, you'd have a, I don't know, a three-headed president or something like that. Um, that would be elected by Congress, not the people, but Congress would elect this person. So that's the similarity between the two and how the national, the national executive should be um, um, elected by, and then also a national ju judiciary that's appointed by the executive, not the Congress. So under the New Jersey plan, um, you'd have more than one president or more than one head person that's elected by Congress, and then the president would appoint who the judges are, which is kind of how it works today. So we have these two plans, two conflicts. Um, the Great Compromise, as is known, was, was uh, an idea that, was, that came from the Connecticut delegates, that suggested we have a two-chamber Congress, a bicameral Congress, one called the House of Representatives, which would be based on population, and all revenue laws would start there. And the second, or the upper house, would be called the Senate, which would be represented equally, two per state. Um, so basically they took the idea of, of both the New Jersey and um, Virginia plan and 
took the best parts of him and combined him. The delegate from Connecticut did. And House of Representatives, based on population, which would be which would be helpful for the larger states, they would have more representation in the House of Representatives compared to um, the Senate, which is two per state, which helps out the small states. They're on equal ground. Small states are on equal ground of representation in the Senate with every state in the Union. Um, so two per state. So that was the the great compromise by the that was suggested by the Connecticut delegates. Um, another compromise to the Constitution was over slavery, um, how they were going to resolve slavery. So when it comes to deciding what the population of a state is, in the South they had a large population of slaves. And the northern states didn't think it would be fair for them to be counted towards the population of the state, the slaves. So the compromise is that three-fifths of the entire enslaved population within a state would be counted towards the state's population when it comes to representing um, how many representatives you get in the House of Representatives. Um, so that was a compromise, only three-fifths of the entire slave. Some people, some, don't get confused, some people think that they counted every slave individually as three-fifths of a person. That's not the case. They took the entire population of the slave in that state and only counted three-fifths of them towards the population. So it's not three-fifths of the individual person, it's three-fifths of the entire enslaved um, community in that state itself. Um, the other compromise was on slavery also, just on, on, on banning it or not banning it. The, the North, they weren't, um, didn't, uh, let's see, uh, I'm sorry, they, did, they thought slavery was inhumane and many Northern delegates wanted to ban slavery trade, but they knew that the South would never pass a constitution if they banned slavery. So the compromise is that slave trade wouldn't, wouldn't be, would be protected for 20 years and wouldn't be banned until 1808. So they gave them a 20-year cushion to um, um, ban, trade, ban the trade of slavery. Um, that's just, they, didn't, they weren't against having slaves itself, just banning the slave trade they were against. So in 1808, they banned slave trade, not, not having slaves. So. And then the other compromise was how to elect the president. Um, some of them thought that um, presidents should be chosen by state legislators or by the national legislators. Um, some thought they should be elected directly by the people, and so instead they they came up with a middleman called the Electoral College where the state state electors would choose the president. People would vote for the state electors, and the state electors would then choose who they would vote for for president, which is the system we have today. Um, so the presidential election was just another compromise of the Constitution itself. Um, despite all these compromises, there was still um, a fight to ratify or to pass the Constitution. And in order to pass the Constitution, they made all these compromises, um, but in order to pass it, they had to get at least nine states to ratify or approve of the Constitution, although many of them, they felt like it was necessary that every state agree or it would the Constitution would just fail if you didn't have all 13 colonies or states agreeing to the Constitution. You would, they want to be unified. Um, it did go into effect on in 1781, in June 21st, 1781. Um, there were two states that held out, and it was totally until they got their government running, um, their own state government running, but um, it was totally ratified in 1790 by all 13 colonies. But again, there was, like I said, there was a fight to pass it. You had two groups of people um, writing essays and pamphlets, either defending it or trying to get people to vote against it. So one of those was the Anti-Federalists. They were mainly supported by farmers and laborers. Um, they didn't want a national government. They feared that it would, be, it would be similar to the rule under England. And they thought the whole document itself was extra legal or um, done illegally. Because it was done in secret, it wasn't. They didn't. They feel like the the members of Congress didn't have the right to do this, to to ban, to get rid of the Articles of Confederation and, and create the Constitution. So they believe the whole document itself was extra legal, and the main thing that they that they were against about the Constitution it didn't have a Bill of Rights, and that was that's the linchpin that actually saved the Constitution from being to to be passed. Um, and then you have the Federalists, Federalists on the other side, who were supported by. Um, the upper class or merchants, people with uh, more money, um, 
who wanted stronger national governments and didn't think, think that there was a bill of, bill of rights were needed because most states at the time had already passed bill of rights and didn't think it was necessary for the national government to have one as well. Um, they wrote essays and pamphlets, like I said, and argued, and because eventually what happened was they, um, the Federalists agreed to adopt a Bill of Rights, and then um, the promise of the Bill of Rights was the key to winning over the other states and, and ratifying the Constitution. Um, during the first Congress, they uh, they uh, they uh, passed twelve amend or they had twelve um, they proposed twelve amendments to the Constitution um, that was sent to the states, and only ten of them were passed. Ten were ratified, which is called the Bill of Rights. And these protects rights as freedom of press, speech, religion, um, due process, and the right to a fair trial and trial by jury. So, to um, go back to the essential questions here, um, after this, you should be able to know how did English, how did the English political heritage affect the development of democracy in America? What events led to the Declaration of Independence? Um, why did American leaders conclude that Articles of Federation needed to be modified? What challenges did they have to overcome to write the Constitution? And lastly, how did the Bill of Rights come about and what is its significance? All right, that's chapter two.